Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Rohit. Uh, I work for the Cloud Media Systems team, a part of the content engineering organization at Netflix. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is the Netflix Media Database. So as the scale of content at Netflix keeps growing, uh, we need to make several engineering investments. This is one such initiative driven by our team. Uh, through the course of this presentation, I'll be using the acronym NMDB interchangeably with the term Netflix Media Database. Before I get started, I wanted to call out that uh, the Netflix Media Database, NMDB, is joint work with my colleagues Arsan, Cyril, Shenzhen, Sriram, Subhu, and E. This is the outline of my presentation. So I'll start out by motivating the need for a media database like NMDB. Following that, I will give an overview of NMDB. I'll then jump into the data model. And lastly, share some implementation details. So uh, the Netflix user experience, a big part of it comes from the seamless user interface, uh, meaningful content recommendations, efficient streaming of media, as well as the large catalog of content that Netflix supports. As I'll show next, a uh, bunch of business workflows need to all come together and these are varying complexities to make this experience happen for us. <clears throat> Artwork images, title synopsis, or uh, video previews, they go a long way in helping uh, users find the relevant shows and movies. <clears throat> With the increasing volume of content, uh, there is a need for us to synthesize, to create systems that can help the creatives synthesize these merchandise assets at high volume in a timely fashion. One could do this, for example, by uh, uh, working with the audio and video materials underlying the content and applying uh, machine learning computer vision algorithms to select things like video frames and clips. These could serve as starting materials for creating engaging media assets. The content recommendations system economically surfaces uh, choices that are personalized to the tastes and preferences of the end users. Being able to come up with efficient and compact feature representations of the content that's uh, part of the Netflix catalog is, uh, is, is critical to this function. Uh, one could, in principle, build machine learning models uh, that work of media materials like audio, subtitles, and video, as well as the metadata that comes with the title and hope to draw features from there. Content quality is uh, another big factor. It's uh, very vital to the Netflix user experience. Uh, the image I'm showing here corresponds to a title from the Western classical genre. Uh, in this case, what happened was that some of the lights that were used for the production of the title became themselves a part of the video. So uh, this is a situation we would like to avoid, and it would be great if there were automated systems that could uh, detect and perhaps localize through bounding boxes like the ones I'm showing uh, towards the end of the slide, towards the corner of the slide, uh, help localize such objects. This uh, illustrates another such problem. In this case, there is subtitles text that's overlaying on top of text that is burnt in video, making the whole experience unreadable. So what I wanted to say is that across all these various use cases, uh, artwork, content recommendations, as well as content quality, there is a big overlap between the core component algorithms that they use. For example, video short change data is an essential ingredient for artwork as well as the recommendations problem. Uh, if you're working with a video, you can divide it up into shots, and from each shot, uh, pick the top few frames that are uh, pretty, and use them as candidates for artwork. Likewise, for your recommendation algorithms, you could use the video media, break it up into shots, create per shot representations, and uh, derive uh, important features from them. Going back to the text on text detection problem, a modular way to solve this problem might be to do a text in video detection style of analysis on your video, and uh, uh, independent of that, run a subtitle positioning analysis. Both of these analyses can proceed independently of each other and even persisted separately. 
The actual text-to-text -text detection application can be completely outside of this, and it can combine, these, uh, combine the outputs of these analysis to produce its desired outcome. So such a modular way of persisting data allows for reuse of data. As an example, the text detection data itself can be used for problems like artwork, wherein uh, when you pick up video frames that have lots of text in them, maybe they are not great candidates for creating artwork. So all in all, this aspect of data reuse, as well as the point that many of these analyses can be computationally intensive, making data recompute an expensive proposition, make an argument for a data system that can store any of the media analysis that we compute. So uh, in other words, we need a media database. So the Netflix media database is, uh, as I uh, suggested, a persistent store for dynamically varying metadata, highly technical metadata, and it's applicable to various media assets, uh, audio, subtitles, time text, video, uh, images. And uh, this is a multi-tenant system. So uh, different applications can concurrently interact with the system uh, without interfering with each other. This is a system set up for scale also. You can actually ask arbitrary queries on the spatiotemporal media volume. As an example, let's say you conduct a face detection analysis uh, on a certain video, and you deposit that into the NMDB system. Uh, what you could do after that is maybe ask questions like, hey, from time, say, 13 to 27, is there a face in the top right quadrant of video? So queries like those, they become eminently feasible once you have modeled data correctly for the system. This is how a user perceives NMDB. Uh, let's say you are build, uh, building a computer vision algorithm. Chances are that as you work through the algorithm, uh, you will be creating newer and newer models and perhaps even different types of data schema. So NMDB will allow you to define the concept of a data store. It's a, it's a three tuple, uh, consists of a namespace qualifier, a metadata name, that could be like your algorithm, uh, your, uh, and a generation number that could be used to version your algorithm. The fact that every data store can live in isolation from the others is what enables the multi-tenancy of the system. Uh, I'll give a quick overview of some user features. So on the security dimension, uh, the system supports the usual authentication and authorization aspects. It also acts as a vault for content. So uh, if we are working with pre-release content, then uh, the content security mechanisms put in place uh, ensure that access is uh, very well managed. Access to the individual data stores is uh, managed by the data store owner. Uh, this is really a multi-tenancy ask, uh, and the concept we use is that of ac access permissions, much like file systems, uh, uh, for example, the Unix file system. Further, a system like this would be highly successful if we read a lot more from it than we are writing to it. So we always had that in mind and designed the system for high read throughput. Uh, I wanted to highlight that this system is a structured data system. So every data store that you create uh, has a corresponding data schema. As a developer, you have to do upfront work to define the schema for the data that you will be putting in the system. The system is a schema on write system. So when you are writing data into the system, there will be validations built in that will check for things like schema compliance. This was partly motivated by the fact that uh, NMDB is a read-heavy system, so we want to do all the hard work at the time of writing uh, so that the reads can be blazing fast. As I indicated earlier, the system is capable of representing media metadata that varies spatially and temporally, and we use integer units for representing everything that allows us to have things like sample accuracy. Uh, I'll give you a glimpse of the data model now. So uh, uh, this structure is inspired by IMF, Interoperable Master Format, as well as the W3C subtitling model uh, developed as a part of the time text markup language standard. We call this the media document model. So when you're working with a media file or a media asset, 
that's what would map to the meta document. If there is information that, or metadata that you want to persist that is applicable to the whole media asset, you capture it at the top level uh, as asset metadata. The timeline aspects of the media are captured in the concept of tracks. So a media document can comprise multiple tracks and each track uh, can comprise multiple components. Let's say you're working with a media file that has both audio and video modalities in it. So they can be cap uh, captured as separate tracks and uh, perhaps things like the individual audio channels could be captured as separate components. The actual uh, spatiotemporal events like a rectangular uh, region in a video that lives in a certain time interval could be captured as events and regions. Uh, this slide should help uh, lend some tangibility to that. So let's say we are working with this video sequence and uh, we conduct a phase detection analysis on this. So the first event uh, would be corresponding to the red box. That, that's the first phase that we detect uh, for the first three frames. And then the second event is the orange box. The JSON snippet shown here uh, is actually a representation of this data in the media document format. The, the units of spatiotemporal measurements on the video sequence are captured at the component level, highlighted in blue. And the two individual events are uh, captured separately as uh, red and orange colors, respectively. I'll give, uh, sh I'll share some implementation details of the system now. So this is an architecture view of the system. Uh, our current implementation uses open source databases, Cassandra and Elasticsearch. Uh, NMDB is implemented as a suite of microservices. Uh, that's a very Netflix thing. Uh, each microservice is typically assigned a single responsibility. So the validation service in the system is res responsible for schema compliance of the data. The persistent service serves as the source of truth. The indexing service does spatiotemporal indexing, which is what is leveraged by the query service to answer arbitrary queries related to the media. All of this can be orchestrated through a control plane. So uh, writing data to NMDB entails uh, first uploading a media document to an object store, then triggering the ingestion workflow. Third, the validation service comes in, downloads the media document, and performs the relevant validation checks. Fourth, the persistent service saves the data. This is what creates the source of truth. And this is done with uh, what is called as read after write consistency semantics. In the context of distributed systems, these are uh, pretty strong semantics. The indexing service operates with the more relaxed semantics of eventual consistency. All in all, this is a fully decentralized system with no architectural bottlenecks, and that's what helps us to scale. So as we work through the system, we encountered a variety of challenges, and I'm sharing some of them here. First. The mirror document model is hierarchical and uh, not very amenable to parallel processing. So we are looking at ways of uh, extending the model to, to be able to work with fragments of mirror documents that can be corresponding to portions of uh, larger mirror documents. Uh, as the system evolves, we will need to support complex analytical queries and uh, we are looking at ways to address that. Lastly, because the system is highly scalable, one could in principle throw lots and lots of hardware on the system and achieve any throughput. But we are really interested in uh, getting the best performance for a given hardware cost and being efficient in the use of cloud resources. So uh, with this, I will conclude my presentation. Uh, these are some of the links that uh, one could take a look at uh, uh, related to what I just talked about. And thank, thank you. you very much, Rohit. Awesome.